Today we're going to talk about how postal workers are finally fighting back against Louis DeJoy and his efforts to sabotage the mail, and how Trump and Republicans handed Joe Biden a massive win at the Democratic convention. And I speak with Congresswoman and former VP contender Karen Bass about Congress's new bill to fully fund the USPS and the impacts that delaying the mail is having on Republican voters. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen, and you're listening to No Lie. Okay, let's start off with the Postal Service. We've seen quite a bit of action regarding the Postal Service in the last few days, and it's moving quickly, so I'm sure by the time you listen to this, we'll know even more. But let's begin with Louis DeJoy testifying to the Senate on Friday, August 21st. Now, we already know that DeJoy said he's suspending the decommissioning of sorting machines until after the election because he says he didn't want to give the appearance of impacting election mail. (laughs) Yeah, we wouldn't want to give the appearance of impacting election mail by doing something that directly impacts election mail. That's like if you're setting your curtains on fire and then you agree to stop because you don't want to give the appearance that you're trying to burn your house down. So yeah, thanks, Louis DeJoy. We sure do appreciate the thoughtfulness. But on the subject of those sorting machines, here's what DeJoy told Senator Peters from Michigan during the hearing. We've heard about the sorters. You addressed that earlier. Will you be bringing back any mail sorting machines that have been removed uh, since you've become Postmaster General? Will any of those come back? There's no intention to do that. They're not needed, sir. So you will not bring back any processors? They're not needed, sir. That he won't bring back any of the decommissioned machines. So the point here was that uh, when DeJoy had come out and made his self-righteous proclamation that he would pause all removals until after the election because God forbid he gave the impression that he's doing something wrong and the Democrats celebrated that victory, the point here is that the damage was already done. Those machines were already enough to have the impact that Trump was looking for. And we're already seeing delays. People who used to receive mail in a couple days are now waiting weeks. The damage is done. The point is that DeJoy knew that's all he needed to do to accomplish his goal. So him granting us the concession of pausing those removals wasn't a concession at all. It was him handing us a a hollow victory. And he knew that because do not forget that this is an official in the Trump administration and they are devoid of shame and they exist to destroy the agencies they oversee. Now, I'll talk more about this in my interview with Karen Bass, but the House has now passed a bill 257 to 150, giving $25 billion in funding to the Postal Service. And included in those 257 yes votes were 26 Republicans, which (laughs) these days might as well be 100, right? And that's that's proof of a few things. It's proof that uh, Republicans are finally realizing how toxic Trump is to them and giving themselves permission to jump ship. And also that protecting the Postal Service is a winning issue. It's not the the partisan cudgel that Trump and Republicans thought it would be. Turns out Republicans rely on the Postal Service just as much as Democrats, if not more. But I do want to point out that one of the most important elements of that bill is that it would reinstate those machines and mailboxes that DeJoy claimed weren't necessary because Again, while a lot of people celebrated the fact that DeJoy paused removals, the second thing that everybody said was, okay, now what about the sorting machines and mailboxes that were taken away? So the fact that this legislation would seek to undo those changes instead of just insulating the post office from the next administration is really important here, right? This isn't just for show. This would actually be meaningful and impactful legislation. And of course, that hinges upon whether it goes anywhere in the Senate. So frankly, I don't know, and and I highly doubt if McConnell will even bring it up for a vote in the Senate. And and even if he did, I wouldn't bet a single dime on Republicans doing the right thing. But I would just say this, when a senior doesn't get his or her medication, that is on the Republican Party. When a veteran doesn't get medication, that is on the Republican Party. When a farmer doesn't get livestock or, or feed because because they either die or spoil because of delays, that is on the Republican Party. When you incur a late fee on your bills because they didn't arrive in time, that is on the Republican Party. Like, I don't care how long you've been a Republican. I don't care if you've pulled the lever for for the GOP since Eisenhower. You got to be able to recognize that this is a party that is letting people suffer in real time because they're more concerned with helping one man consolidate power for himself than they are with protecting even the most basic function of American society. But there is actually good news, and 
um, I'm sorry to bury the lead here, but outside of Congress, some postal workers have taken matters into their own hands. So despite orders not to reinstall decommissioned equipment, postal workers in the Seattle-Tacoma area of Washington have reinstalled sorting machines anyway. Postal workers in Dallas, Texas, also attempted to reinstall four sorting machines, although those attempts were unsuccessful because the machines were missing pieces. But the point here is that they made the effort. And in Washington, it was a successful effort. And that shows that hopefully these postal workers are pushing back. And here's the thing. The postal workers know what a disaster DeJoy's policies have been. They know better than anyone. So if there's anyone who'd want these machines to be reinstalled, it's them. I feel perfectly fine speaking for postal workers when I say that USPS employees unequivocally do not want to be the front lines in a nationwide voter suppression scheme on behalf of the Republican Party. So I would just say, keep going. Reinstall those machines around the country. Don't just let the Tacoma and, and, and Dallas folks jump on the grenade here. Plug them back in and get your jobs done. Americans are watching now. Congress is watching now. Our presidential and vice presidential nominees are watching now. It's going to be a hell of a lot harder for Louis DeJoy to punish people for doing their jobs now that the whole country wants nothing more than for this guy to be investigated and charged. So thank you to the postal workers in Tacoma and Dallas. And I really, really hope that I'll have a lot more to thank after this. Next, let's talk about the Democratic Convention and Joe Biden's performance specifically. So Republicans had spent months attacking Joe Biden's cognitive abilities and claiming that he couldn't string two words together and that the guy didn't know where he was. And between the fact that Biden wasn't really holding many events because um, there's a deadly pandemic sweeping across the country and the fact that, yeah, in fairness, he's known to make a gaffe or two, there was a world in which Trump's attacks might have held some merit. But that would depend upon his performance at the convention. That was his first real moment to address the nation live and to basically sink or swim, right? It wouldn't just be him accepting the nomination, right? It would be, it would be the possible validation of literal months of Republican attacks. So it's the end of the Democratic convention. Joe Biden walks up to the podium. And here are a few moments from the speech. For love is more powerful than hate. Hope is more powerful than fear. And light is more powerful than dark. This is our moment. This is our mission. May history be able to say that the end of this chapter of American darkness began here tonight as love and hope and light join in the battle for the soul of the nation. And this is a battle we will win and we'll do it together. I promise you. To claim that Joe Biden met the moment would be an understatement. Biden delivered to a degree that no one could argue with. And you don't have to take my word for it. Here is the entire slate of Fox News hosts right after the speech. Oh, I thought it was an enormously effective speech. Remember, Donald Trump has been talking for months about Joe Biden as mentally shot, a captive of the left. And it, I guess Biden was reading from a teleprompter and a prepared speech. But I thought that he blew a hole, a big hole in that characterization. Michelle Obama stuck the landing, I think, keeping with that theme that Joe Biden just hit a home run in the bottom of the ninth. Well, I thought uh, it was an excellent end. Uh, it was a very good speech. Um, he had a balancing act here tonight. Uh, uh, he was trying to balance uh -huh. two different things. One was the image portraying himself as a unifier who would bring the country together. Uh, he did so, very, I thought, very effectively. And if I were a Republic, Republican strategist in the Trump campaign, I'd be worried about how long and how effectively he carries that theme forward because that's the thing that will keep the swing voters in his camp if they are in his camp or bring them to him. Chris Wallace, Dana Perino, and Karl Rove. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying they're going to vote for Biden, but you don't usually have Rupert Murdoch's entire staff applauding in unison for the guy set to take out a Republican president. And the reason that Joe Biden was so universally praised was because Donald Trump, in, in his infinite wisdom, set the bar on the ocean floor. Like, you gotta hand it to the business genius who spent literal months telling everyone that Joe Biden wouldn't even remember his name, that he wouldn't be able to find the podium. Trump's whole argument was that Biden couldn't pass a dementia test. First of all, Trump made himself out to look ridiculous by bragging about passing a test that involves correctly identifying an elephant to begin with. But 
Beyond that, way to lower the bar, way to set the stage. Biden won the second he was able to put a shirt on, but then to go out there and deliver likely one of the best speeches of his career, a a speech that absolutely met the moment, well, then that was it. It was an unequivocal success for Joe Biden. And meanwhile, you know, we're out here holding our breath for Joe. We've all heard Trump's speeches. You want to talk about shitting the bed? This is Donald Trump. We're talking about a guy who walks up to the mic and some errant synapses fire in his brain. And all of a sudden we're talking about killer windmills and dead birds and toilets that don't flush and low pressure shower heads and soldiers with no bullets and empty cupboards um, and w- wanting college football back and then airports during the Revolutionary War, nuking hurricanes, Antifa super soldiers, abolishing the suburbs, injecting disinfectant and acing dementia tests. If Joe Biden said one one thousandth of what Trump says on a daily basis, Fox News would be calling for him to be taken back to the nursing home. And they would be right. <laughs> like, so look, I think it's easy to fall for this trap of letting the right dictate the terms of the conversation. I'm guilty of it too, right? We basically allowed them to decide that if Biden screwed up, it would validate their attacks on him. But we really have to take a step back here and acknowledge that when your guy is Donald Trump, then I'm sorry, but you really don't have any say in whether or not someone else is qualified or not. And mark my words, when the Republican convention begins, I guarantee you that you're going to see Trump try and accomplish uh, the same thing that Biden did so well. He'll try and prove that he can be a president for all Americans because he's realizing that the key to Biden's success is the fact that he's building a broad coalition. And so Trump will squint his way through a prepared speech on a teleprompter And without fail, some reporters will have a fainting spell over the president's new tone and congressional Republicans will claim that this is the best speech since the Gettysburg Address because Trump managed to not shit in a bag and set it on fire right there on stage, but it will fall flat because that is not who Donald Trump is. We know Donald Trump. He's the guy who separated kids from their parents at the border. He's the guy who exploded the national deficit to give himself a tax cut. He extorted a foreign country for dirt on his opponent. He knew that Russia placed bounties on American soldiers' heads and let them get away with it. And he's letting vets and seniors go without medications because he'd rather destroy the post office than let people vote. That is who Donald Trump is. And no teleprompter speech is going to change that, regardless of whether Trump can stop himself from going off on some tangent about post-birth abortion or Sharia law. So ignore the bells and whistles of yet another four days of the Trump show at this Republican convention. Because actions speak far louder than words, and his actions over the last four years are beyond disqualifying. To listen to my interview with Karen Bass, check out the interviews playlist on my YouTube channel. That's it for this episode. Talk to you next week. You've been listening to No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen, produced by Sam Graber, music by Wellesley, interviews captured and edited for YouTube and Facebook by Nicholas Nicotera, and recorded in Los Angeles, California. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your preferred podcast app, Feel free to leave a five-star rating and a review and check out BrianTylerCohen.com for links to all of my other channels.